Today, we're going to continue in this series called A Bountiful Life. Now, what is a bountiful life? Uh, well, we're not talking about, when we say a blessed life, we're not talking about what a lot of people think about when they think about a blessed life. What do most American Christians think about when you say, have a blessed day, have a blessed life? What do they think? Well, they think of a, a life of ease. They think of a life of no problems. They think of a life with lots of money in the bank. They think of a life that maybe they really are blessed financially or whatever. Now, there's certainly nothing wrong with being blessed financially. I like being blessed financially. I, I like that a lot better than having no money, okay? But God never promises to us in a bountiful life. He never promises to us a life of ease. He never promises to us a life with no problems, what he does tell us, however, is that when we follow him, when we live for God's kingdom, what happens is that God will use us. He will give us purpose. He will bless us. But once again, being blessed doesn't always mean that you have no problems, that you have a life of ease, okay? So we're talking about a bountiful life. Last week, we began talking about sowing. And over the next four weeks, for the entire month of September, we're talking about this, and uh, we're looking at it from the perspective of what Jesus, one of his most often told parables, or uh, if you will, themes in his parables, was that of sowing and reaping. It was the idea of sowing seeds and reaping a harvest. So we're going to be looking at that. Last week, we talked about sowing. Today, I'm going to talk to you about plowing. Plowing. Now, you may think that's an odd thing to talk about, but I think it'll make sense to you when we get to the end today. What does the Bible say about plowing? Um, well, I grew up, most of you know, I grew up in North Carolina. I grew up working on a farm. My grandparents on both sides were tobacco farmers. Uh, my dad's side of the family, Sanford Paris Miller, he was a tobacco farmer. His dad, my uh, great-grandpa, uh, William Henry Miller, was a tobacco farmer. And my great-great-grandpa on that side, Philip Snyder Miller, was also a tobacco farmer. On my mom's side of the family, uh, my grandpa, Wendell Phillips, uh, was a tobacco farmer. His dad, my great-grandpa, Abraham Zeller Phillips, was a tobacco farmer and a businessman. And uh, my great-great-grandpa on that side, his name was Abraham Phillips, and he was also a tobacco farmer and a businessman. Uh, my great-grandma's dad, he was a tobacco farmer as well, and his name was Frost Snow. You got to love those names, right? Uh, those are great names. <laughs> Uh, but one thing about every one of these farmers, and I think they understood this, that if you did not plow, you would not reap a harvest, at least not the kind of harvest you wanted. Plowing, what is the metaphor for plowing in the Bible? The metaphor is that you're preparing. And in the kingdom of God, Jesus talks about the kingdom of God quite a bit. Um, and he tells us in the passage we're going to read today that we've got to put our hand to the plow. What does that mean? Well, plowing certainly is preparing. It's getting ready by faith for harvest. And so today I want to talk to you about doing that. This metaphor is about working for God's kingdom. In the kingdom of God, you and I, Jesus used this metaphor, he used this analogy, this uh, this play on words, we've got to be willing to plow. We've got to be willing to put our hand to the plow. Now, what does that mean? It means to work for God's kingdom. It means to prepare for a harvest. It means that uh, you're going to do this in conjunction with a team. Did you know that in Jesus' day, plowing was a team sport? You say, well, that's an odd thing. I'm going to watch some football this afternoon. That seems like a team sport, but not plowing. No, not in that kind of team sport. Plowing in Jesus' day, when he used this metaphor, it was always done in teams. You didn't plow alone, but you plowed with someone else. Sometimes a community would come together. Uh, sometimes a family would come together 
Sometimes a neighborhood would come together, but they would work together for the harvest. And what does that tell us? Well, I think it gives a, a very clear indication that when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to working for God's purpose, that you and I must really be a part of the church, that it is in conjunction with the church that we plow best, that we work best, that we work for the harvest best. In other words, we're not to try to do the Christian life alone. A lot of people think that the Christian life can be done alone, but that's just simply not the case. If you are a follower of Christ and you understand what Jesus taught, you understand that uh, that uh, working for God's kingdom is a team sport, that we do it together with the church. Now, I hear people say often, well, you know, I can worship God just as well as out here on the lake as you can at church. And that is true. You should be able to worship God anywhere. You should be able to worship God on your way to work, on Monday morning, going through traffic, now, to be honest, we probably tend to curse more than we do to worship when we're doing that. But the truth is, you should be able to worship God anywhere, anytime. But that would be a mistake to think that that is the singular purpose of the church. The purpose of the church is that we come together as a body in order to worship, to fulfill, to work for the kingdom of God. And here's what I don't believe anybody can say with a straight face that you can do as much for God's kingdom alone as you can with a team in a church. You can't. Uh, when you come together as a church, what do you have? Collectively, you have more money to invest in the kingdom of God. Uh, collectively, you're able to use your gift for the kingdom of God. God's given you a gift. God expects you to use those spiritual gifts for Him, that natural talent for Him. When we collectively give in a church, we're able to do more. When we collectively serve in a church, we're able to do more. We're able to accomplish more. And so the idea here is that in plowing, what you and I are to do is we're to prepare to work for the kingdom of God. Now we defined the kingdom of God last week as the, the mission, the purpose of God. Uh, the kingdom of God is that God is in control, that he eventually is going to bring everything under King Jesus, okay? I believe that the church is a part of the kingdom of God. And so when Jesus talks about the kingdom, I believe he's talking about what you and I are to do when we come uh, when it comes to serving God uh, and to serving in the church. Well, we're going to read a passage today in Luke chapter 9. You can turn there in your Bible if you'd like. You can follow along on the screen. You can follow along on your phone, uh, whatever way you prefer. But let's begin reading in verse number 57, Luke chapter 9 and verse 57. And as they were going along the road, someone said to him, they were saying to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man, that was an Old Testament term for the Messiah, and Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah whenever we would refer to himself as the Son of Man. He said, The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And to another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Well, I want to talk to you today about three principles that I see here that will help you when it comes to being able to be a part of working for the kingdom of God. Number one, discipleship requires total commitment. 
total commitment. What Jesus was talking about here was being completely committed, not a toe dipper. We talked about toe dippers a couple weeks ago. You know what it means to be a toe dipper, right? Remember when you were a kid, and this was back in the day uh, when I was a kid, uh, the first time we would go swimming, I grew up and be in the mountains of North Carolina, and man, the first time you get in that water, it was cold. And you, you would sometimes just be a toe dipper. You'd dip your foot in, then you'd get up to your ankle, and eventually you'd freeze to death, but you'd get all in, all right? And I like the cannonballer better. It just felt better. It didn't hurt as bad. Uh, it didn't take as long. You got used to it. And so I would just cannonball in. Well, there are a lot of Christians that are toe dippers. And here's what Jesus is saying, that you don't need to be a toe dipper as a Christian. Total commitment. He was telling us to prioritize following him over everything. When he said, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. And he said, let the dead bury their dead. You, you got to understand what Jesus was saying. If you don't understand this, and if you don't know uh, that uh, what he was saying, then you can misunderstand what he meant. Uh, Jesus was not saying that having food or shelter or caring for your family are important. That's not what he was saying. In fact, we know that the Bible commands us, actually, to take care of our family. Leviticus 21, 1 through 3. Do you know what it gives? It gives instructions on dealing with funerals for your family. So Jesus was not being insensitive and saying, well, if someone in your family dies, don't even go to the funeral. Disrespect your family. That's not what he's saying. We, we read in 1 Kings, uh, Kings chapter 19, verse 20, that Elijah, remember Elijah and Elisha? Well, Elisha, uh, that he went to kiss his father and mother goodbye before he began his mission. Elijah had said, you need to come. God's going to use you. You're going to be a prophet. And he said, before I do that, let me go tell my parents goodbye. And he did. So God was not suggesting, Jesus was not suggesting that we shouldn't honor our parents. In fact, that's one of the Ten Commandments. We're to honor our parents. He was not saying that you shouldn't go to your family's funeral or take care of your family. That's not what he was saying. Uh, in fact, it says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, that those who do not look after their own family are worse than an infidel. So what was he saying? When he said foxes have holes and birds have nests, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. When he said, let the dead bury their dead, but you come and follow me. When he said, put your hand to the plow and don't look back. What was he saying? Well, I believe what he was saying was that we can easily get distracted from serving God by the cares and pleasures of this life. Have you ever noticed that it's easy to get distracted? And not by bad things. You know, if it was by bad things, if, if you got easily distracted as a Christian by, you know, oh, I got to go do my drug deal before I go to church today. No, that's not what happens most of the time, okay? Um, what happens is we're not distracted by the really bad things in life. We're distracted by the normal things in life. We're distracted by our job. We're distracted by our schedule. We're distracted by the cares of life. Is there anything wrong with taking a vacation? No. Is there anything wrong with having a nice car? No. Is there anything wrong with watching football? No. Unless you're watching the Falcons. All right, so uh, there's nothing wrong with these things. These are normal things in life. But we've, I believe what Jesus was saying was this. If you're not careful, you can easily get distracted. We get distracted by our jobs. The Bible never says we shouldn't have a job. In fact, the Bible says the opposite. It said we should have a job. But what we must be careful not to do is get distracted and get our minds and our focus off the main thing. The main thing in life is not your job. It's not how many weeks of vacation you get. It's not the amount of money you have in the bank account. These are important things. These are good things. 
But the main thing in life is for us to serve God. The main thing in life is for us to put our hand to the plow. That's our, that's our job. That's our main focus. And so we must not get distracted. That's what Jesus was saying. It's easy to get distracted by things in life that aren't necessarily bad. But we've got to have total commitment. Heard about a chicken and a pig that were walking along, and uh, the chicken saw a sign that said, ham and egg breakfast to raise money for orphans. And the chicken thought, oh my goodness, that's a wonderful cause. And he said to the pig, he said, we need to go make a donation. Ham and eggs for breakfast. You can make a donation. I can give eggs. You can make a donation. You can give ham. Uh, that will be a wonderful cause. We need to go make a donation. And the pig looked back at the chicken. He said, yeah, that's a donation for you. But for me, that's a total commitment. You know what Jesus is looking for? He's looking for total commitment. He's not looking for toe dippers. He's not looking for people that are what I would call Sunday Christians. You know what that's like, right? I mean, the fact is, we get so caught up sometimes in everyday living that we forget that the Christian life is not just about church on Sunday. Now, should you go to church? Yes. I'm glad you're here. Um, but look, that's not, that's not what your life is only about. It's about living for the kingdom of God every day of your life. That's what Jesus is saying. And what you and I must understand is that in this total commitment, what Jesus has called us to do is to step all the way in. A number of years ago, I was in, before we started this church, um, I was in evangelism. And uh, I traveled from church to church all across the country, and I would do that every weekend, and uh, sometimes even during the week. And I'll never forget, I was out of town one time, and Kim and our kids, uh, they were, our kids were much smaller then, uh, very young, and uh, my wife, Kim, would take our kids to any kind of event that she could to get them out of the house, keep them entertained, keep them from tearing up the house, all right? So uh, she called me very excited one day. She said, you'll not believe it, but there is a fair that's coming in. It's right next door, and the fair is free. She had me at free, and I'm like, she said, what do you think? I said, I think that is awesome. Take the kids to the free fair. She did. What she did not realize, and what I was not aware of, was that the free fair was free to get in, but it wasn't free to enjoy the rides. I mean, it's free to walk in, but if you wanted to enjoy the fair, you know what you had to do? You had to pay. It cost you something to enjoy the fair. If you wanted to ride the roller coaster, that cost you something. If you want to ride the spinny things that make me throw up, uh, then that was going to cost you something. If you wanted to get cotton candy, if you wanted to get some popcorn, if you wanted to get a hot dog, the free fare was not really free to enjoy it. It was free to get in, but it was not free to enjoy it. And you know what I think Jesus was telling us here? Salvation is free. It's free to get in. It costs Jesus everything, but for us, we get redemption, we get forgiveness, we get to be made right with God, and it is free. Not based on our works, not based on how good you are, not based on how often you go to church, not based on whether or not you smoke, dip, or chew, or run with girls that do, okay? What it's based on is the goodness, the complete work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Whereas salvation is free, but what Jesus was saying was this, discipleship, living a bountiful life, living a life that pleases God, living a life that matters, living a life of purpose, that is not free. It's going to cost you something. So discipleship requires total commitment. Number two, 
Discipleship requires complete focus. You, you got to be all in. You can't be a toe dipper. You got to get all the way in. You got to cannonball into the deep end if you're going to live your life for Jesus. But the second thing we've got to understand is you got to have focus. It can't be an afterthought. It can't be an item on the agenda. It's got to be at the top. In fact, I think the, the more biblical metaphor for us, putting Jesus first, you know, we think as Americans, we think of a, of a checklist, and uh, if it's first on the checklist, we check it off, and then we go on to something else. But that's not really the way the Bible describes putting God first in your life. Putting God first in your life is more like putting Jesus in the center of your life. In other words, it's not just a checklist, and once you go to church on Sunday, you've checked that off for the week. Or, I read my Bible today, so I've checked that off my list. Nothing wrong with having a checklist. I like checklists. But the idea is not that you have a descending order of priorities, but rather that you have Him at the very center of your life. And so, complete focus means that Jesus must be At the center of our lives. Let me read again what he said. No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Looking back means that you are focusing not on the roads ahead, but on what's behind. And any farmer will tell you that if you're going to do that, uh, that you're going to mess up. You're, you're going to make crooked rows. You're, you're not going to get straight, in other words. So what did Jesus want us to know? Well, plowing requires focus. Plowing requires focus. Now, uh, I told you about growing up on a farm. Uh, I started working on my grandpa's farm when I was 12 years old. And uh, first started out working in the chicken houses and then uh, progressed my way up into the fields. By the time I was 13, I was working in tobacco fields. By the time I was 16, I was doing just about everything on the farm. I got to plow. I got to drive the tractor. When I was 12, I started driving the old farm truck. And, you know, that was the best driver's education you could possibly have out in the country on the gravel roads didn't really matter what you hit because it was an old dumpy truck anyway. And so you learned how to drive. Well, I had learned to plow. And uh, when I was 16, I was out plowing on this tractor. Um, and all of a sudden, a thunderstorm came up. You ever been a part of a thunderstorm? Just one of those sudden storms? Well, it starts pouring down, comes down in sheets. And uh, it started raining. Suddenly, it was lightning. And so... I did what I'd been taught to do. I got out of the rain with the tractor and the plow, and I pulled the tractor underneath a shelter at a barn uh, there on the farm. Now, when when I did this, I was in a hurry, and I hit one of the posts that was under the shelter there, holding up the shelter at the barn. And it didn't knock the barn over, okay, but it, it did shake it a little bit. And what I did not know was at the base of that post, there was a bumblebee nest that had been in the ground, okay? So I I bumped that, I jumped off the tractor, and as God would have it, I landed with my foot on the bumblebee nest. Now, because I worked on the farm, uh, I had long pants on, not that there was anything wrong with wearing shorts, Uh, but rather you just wanted to keep your legs from getting all scratched up when you were doing what I was doing. So I had a pair of jeans on, and when I jumped off the tractor and landed on the bumblebee nest, my pants leg just happened to be out, and a whole bunch of bumblebees flew right up my pants leg. Now, I began to do a dance like I'd never done before. In fact, I ran out from under that Uh, that barn, that shelter, and I was running across the field. Now, my grandpa just happened to be in the old farm truck 
kind of watching what I was doing. I guess he was pulling up to see if I was going to get out of the, if I had enough sense to get out of the rain. And he saw me running across the field, smacking and flailing like a madman. He must have thought that I lost my mind. Well, you say, what did you learn that day? Well, I'm sure that there were many things that I learned but one thing that I think I did learn, my grandpa thought I was crazy. He was looking at me from the outside. But one thing that I learned about that is when you're getting stung by bumblebees, you don't care what anybody else thinks. You don't care what anybody else says. Do you know I think Jesus wants us to see this? That if we are going to serve him, we can't be worried about what everybody else thinks or says. We've got to be focused on the mission that God has given us. And so when it comes to living your life, the idea of putting your hand in the plow and not looking back gives us the idea you've got to look ahead. You can't be looking in the past. You can't be wondering about what other people think, but rather you've got to keep your eyes focused on the job that God has given you. Listen to what the Apostle Paul wrote, Philippians 3, 13 to 14. No, dear brothers, I am still not all that I should be, but I am bringing all my energies to bear on this one thing, forgetting the past, he's not looking back, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I strain to reach the end of the race and receive the prize for which God is calling us to heaven because of what Jesus did for us. You get the idea that God wants us to focus on what's ahead? Paul said, I'm going to strain. I'm going to work. I'm going to be determined. I'm not going to worry about what somebody else thinks about me, but rather I'm going to keep my eyes ahead I'm going to put my hand to the plow, and I'm not going to look back. I'm going to keep looking forward. Well, discipleship requires that focus, and then finally, discipleship requires total availability. You've got to have complete focus. You can't be worried about other, what other people think, and you've got to be totally available. That's really what Jesus is talking about. Um, I want to point out just a couple things about looking back, okay? Uh, they come in the form of a warning from Jesus. When he said, anyone who puts his hand to the plow but looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Well, what does he mean by that? Well, looking back can mean a desire for a life of ease rather than a life of total commitment. Now, i got to be honest with you, it's a lot easier not to be committed. It's a lot easier to say, you know what, I'll just do what is convenient. I'll go when I feel like it. I'll serve when I feel like it. I'll give when I feel like it. I'll share the gospel when I feel like it. And the problem is, if you base it on your feelings, then a lot of times you're not going to feel like it. Can I be honest, even as a pastor, even as the pastor of this church, there's sometimes I don't feel like coming. You say, oh my goodness, I can't believe that. I think you wake up every morning at 4 a.m. to the sound of angels' wings flapping and God pipes in, uh, you know, Christian music into your bedroom. Well, it, would it shock you to know, yeah, sometimes I do wake up at 4 a.m., but it's not because angels' wings are flapping, I can promise you that, Okay. Now, the point is this. He wants me to understand that I must have some resolve. i got to have some determination. i got to have some commitment, some faithfulness. Otherwise, I won't finish my race. Did you get that from what Paul wrote? He said, I'm keeping my eyes on the prize. And I'm going to strain. Did you know that sometimes the Christian life is a strain? I don't mean that it's a strain and that it's not good or that it's not better or that it's not best. 
what I mean is that sometimes you just don't feel like it's like this. If you've ever exercised before, if you've been a person that says, you know what, I'm going to be healthy. I'm going to get in shape. I'm going to start exercising. Maybe you start out with walking, or maybe you start out with lifting weights. Or maybe you're like I am, and there have been many, many years. In January, I make a new, fresh commitment. Anybody ever done this before? You make a new, fresh commitment to working out or to lifting weights or whatever. And I can't tell you the number of times that I have made a commitment to lift weights, to get in shape, And on the first week of January, I worked out like crazy. And the next day, I was so sore that I couldn't even reach up to scratch my ear. Anybody ever done that? And then before you knew it, you're like, man, this hurts too much. I can't keep on doing this. And you go back into the old way of living. I think this is what uh, Jesus is talking about here. You've got to have some determination if you're going to finish the race, you got to have some commitment to not giving up. That's what he's saying. Then looking back can mean a desire for the old way of life. I think maybe there are some people that do that. Maybe it's a sin that you just miss. Or maybe it's a relationship. Or more likely, a life that does not concern itself with the kingdom of God and God's purpose. Here's what I know. And I've done this long enough to know this, that if you are going to be committed to the purpose that God has given you for your life, it takes some determination. And if we're not careful, we'll put our hand to the plow and we'll look back. We'll put our hand to the plow and we'll look back. What were we looking back at? Well, wishing that we didn't have to spend so much time, so much energy, so much commitment. But God says, don't put your hand to the plow and look back. Looking back can also mean that you're living a life that is not usable. Did you know that when Jesus said that anyone that puts his hand to the plow and looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God? You know what that word fit means? It means usable. So let's read it that way. Anyone that puts his hand to the plow... And looks back is not usable for the kingdom of God. Well, that puts it in a different perspective, doesn't it? I mean, because what we understand is that what God wants me to do is to be available, to be usable, to look back. It doesn't mean that you necessarily, oh, before I was saved, I was a drug dealer. And, uh, you know, I know that I sing on the worship team now, but I'm thinking about going back to dealing drugs. That's not what it means, okay? I mean, I guess in a way it could. But what Jesus is talking about here is that when you stop looking forward, you're not going to be usable. It's not that God doesn't love you anymore. It's not that God says, I can't use you. What does it mean? It means you're just simply not available. When I put my hand to the plow and I look back, it says, God, I'm too busy. I would, Lord, but you know my schedule. Oh, my goodness, you know how busy I am, Lord. It means you're not available. And I believe that what God wants us to understand is this. If we're going to be usable, we simply got to be available. The best ability is availability. And the question then becomes, are you available For the kingdom of God. Are you going to put your hand to the plow? Are you going to be faithful? Are you going to stand up for the Lord and be used by Him? Well, I would encourage you today to examine your heart. Ask yourself, am I fully committed? Assess your commitments. You say, well, how do I do that? Well, one of the best ways is to look at your schedule. Your spiritual habits. I consider this a pretty good way of assessing where you are. Look at your bank account. Look at your schedule. And you can tell what your priorities are by looking at those two things most of the time. What what is God saying? He's saying, 
I must assess my commitments, my schedule, and my spiritual habits. Are you being available? Are you being used by God? What next step do you need to take? Well, my encouragement today to you is take it. Take that step. Now, what is God saying? I don't believe he's saying that if you ever put your hand to the plow and look back that you're not ever going to be able to be used. In fact, I know that's not true because one of the people that he used the most was Peter, one of his disciples. And we know that Peter, when it came time for Jesus to be crucified, he denied him, not once, but three times. Denied even knowing him. He quit. And after Jesus was crucified, he said, I'm going fishing. I'm going back to the old way of life. And we know that Jesus restored him. And I believe God is a God of second chances. I believe God is a God who will restore if we'll turn to him. And so my question to you today is this. Are you plowing? Do you have your hand on the plow? Are you looking forward? Or are you looking back? Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all to look forward. Help us to keep our eyes focused on the job that you have for us. God, we bless your name, and we say thank you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Today, if you'd like to be saved, uh, I'd like to talk to you about it, or someone at our prayer table here will talk to you about it. If you have questions about salvation, about what it means to commit to Christ, I encourage you to come see someone over here at the prayer desk afterwards, and they'll talk with you about it. They'll uh, be available to help you, uh, and they can pray with you. Uh, If today you would like to make a commitment, I encourage you to make this commitment to the Lord, and I believe God will use you, get your eyes looking ahead, and I believe God will use you if you're willing, if you are available. And so I encourage you to do that. Ushers, if you would come, uh, we are taking our offering. Uh, Now, how do we do the offering here? Well, we always pass the buckets, and I say buckets because they're not really plates. They're, they're buckets, okay? And um, we do that so that for those of you that want to put your card in, you can do it. For those of you that want to put uh, your, uh, your next step card or your offering in, we get about 5% of our offering in the buckets nowadays. Uh, 95% comes in digitally. So you can give by going to... Uh, stillwaters.online. You can give there. You can also give by texting the number 84321, or you can give by giving on the Church Center app, and uh, we'll have a record of that. So that's a great way you can give, okay? Now, in this next service, we are going to also, we're going to do something that we didn't do this service. Uh, We're going to have a prayer of dedication over uh, Bosco Inu. Bosco is one of our deacons, and he was not able to be here when we had the ordination service a few weeks ago because, and you probably have noticed that he hasn't been here as much lately, it's because he's been out of town, and uh, he has been given an opportunity to become a warrant officer. So he's gotten a promotion to being an officer uh, in the military, and that's great for him. And so, but he is here this weekend, and we're going to have prayer over him. So if you'd like to hang out and at least watch him or uh, have prayer with him, I encourage you to to hang out uh, for that second service as well, okay? Thank you so much for being here with us today. I want you to know that I love you. God bless you for being here. I hope you have a great week, and we will see you next Sunday.